My name is Deron Chavis, urban farmer, community activist, and food justice advocate. Join me and my comrades as we talk resiliency, community, social justice, and why black space matters. Farming is not an easy job. It requires collaboration, and at its core, it's a communal effort. Today, we're going to chop it up with my good friend, Mark Davis of Real Roots Food Systems and see how he's getting it in, growing all types of specialty crops and more on this episode. Yo, yo, what's going on? Good night. Yeah, it's good to see you. How you doing? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Tell us about yourself. Uh, my name is Mark Davis. Um, I'm the founder of Real Roots Food Systems, and we are on beautiful, historically power tan Chickahominy land, now known as Hanover County. Farming out here in the sun. Hey, hey, hey. Let's see what's going on. How about you give us a little tour of, of, of the space? Show us some of the things that you're growing. Sure. We split the land three ways, and this is my, my little patch. It's about a fourth of an acre, about the fourth of an acre now. And we've got a mix, a good mix of staple products, North American staples, and more of the foods from Afro-Caribbean cultures from around the world. Very interested to hear more about that. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, Callaloo, Jamaica, that's that's my that's my roots, yeah. that's my family. Beautiful this, green Callaloo here. Yeah, yeah, this is the Callaloo here. Okay. A focus of mine really this year has been summer greens that can survive our summer here yeah. in Virginia. I'm experimenting with a few, uh, Callaloo being one of them, um, Soko Yokoto being another one, which is a Nigerian spinach, um, Salosha, really pretty green and red leaves. Growing real nice in the heat, you know. And then one more over here uh, called Managu, uh, which is a Kenyan green, a Kenyan summer green that also really likes the really likes the heat. That's a, that's an aspect of the work that you're doing to try to introduce people to, you know, these African crops. Totally, I'm trying to really just trying to acknowledge what's happening in the world with the changing climate. And I think that a positive way we can look at it is by pulling from some of the cultures that are already growing those tropical good mm -hmm. summer greens, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. So as a response to climate change, you're like, hey, like how, how can we introduce crops that are more acclimated to hotter climates? 100%, 100%. Um, we can let it get up on us um, or we can kind of be prepared, you know what I mean? And they all delicious anyway. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They all delicious, so it's it's a it's an easy it's an easy thing. We got a particular growing style that I'm trying to use where I dig deeper mounds and higher beds, right? And then I'm doing <clears throat> kind of like a composting carbon capture inside the rows. You know, every time I'm pulling, boom, 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 weeding, anything, I'm throwing them right into the pathway intentionally to capture the, all the carbon into the system and to kind of help with, with flood. Yeah. Heavy rains, we got a ditch for it. Right. Long droughts, we got the mounded, we got the mounded rows. So it can kind of serve both purposes. Amazing, amazing. This here, this is one of my favorites too. This is a, this is a land race, a land race Virginia collet. Oh, um, nice. Okra. Second succession of Koto spinach. Um, we're trying to grow in successions as a big part too, because we're on the smaller scale, you know. Right. A big part of it is, is high intensity, maximizing the space that we have until we can move to a bigger space. Like what is that? Like, give me a sure. quick breakdown. The strategy that I try to put in place with succession planning is timing week to week, a regular planting schedule so that when one kicks out, there's already one, right? So it's like you're staggering your planting. Staggering the planting, exactly, the across the season. We do a lot of succession planting and we do a lot of interplanting, companion planting as well, to try and maximize the- I've seen that, you got like the, the um, you got greens in here yeah. with the uh, with the callaloo. With the callaloo, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we had cabbages growing over winter, chopped them back, took the heads, but now I just left them, left the roots in, because that's a big piece of capturing the water too, leaving those roots in. Stellar. Let's yeah, see what else. Yeah. What else you got growing out here? Let's let's, uh, let's take a peek at the uh, little hoop house we got going on over here. This is the hoop house. Yeah, 
This is a hoop house right here that we built collaboratively. It's a nice structure. Yes, uh, the farmer friends, man. Yeah, oh. the, the the quick quick uh, quick put together, nice. quick quick kit. This not bad. Only, um, yeah, man, it's really accessible mm. to somebody with my amount of money. <laughs> you know. <laughs> What's y'all going there? We got two rows of turmeric and two rows of ginger. We put a succession of beans in with the idea that I'm gonna get them to fix the nitrogen, Boom. chop them off once they flower, and then that nitrogen set will feed the the upcoming turmeric. Less, less fertilizer, more plant life, more biology, nice. you know, you know what time it is. Sweet. So how long is this? No, it's a hundred foot. hundred foot. Yeah, hundred foot row. So, you know, one of my favorite crops to grow is pepper, son. I'm super hyped to see what kind of varieties you got popping off. We got two types of bell peppers right here. My chocolate bell pepper and a red, red bullnose bell pepper. Also have a, a small lunchbox variety. Uh, yeah, you can see they starting to fruit, starting to set fruit. Oh yeah. A little bit in there. See. You know, oh, some big yeah. boys coming in. Big boys coming. And then we got my beloved uh, Scotch bonnets. So tell me about the Scotch bonnets. What should people know about the Scotch Love bonnet? To. Love to. So Scotch bonnet is the the pepper of Jamaica, the spicy pepper of Jamaica. Um, it's a habanero. A variety uh, but it can come in three different colors you know it comes in the green obviously yellow and then will turn slowly into like an orangish red mm -hmm. and we know you know Rasta Rastafari blessings uh, 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 we know what them colors represent so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so for that reason they kind of just they have a special spot in my heart you know spiritually um, and then we got a, a different pepper. The first time I've grown this called a fish pepper. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure you're familiar. I've, I heard about the African American legacy of like these crops coming in from totally from, um, from, from, from Africa. From Africa. These peppers have a special spot in the cuisine and the old old culture. And they kind of disappeared for a second, um, you know, off the markets and whatnot. But it's really important to bring them back. Nice. Bring back our some of our some of our heirlooms you know what i mean yeah uh, uh, how y'all doing with the water it's just out of curiosity because you know climate change is real yeah you know we're dealing with you know global warming hotter summers mm -hmm. we've experienced drought here in virginia we talked about the the trenching style that i built the beds with that's a big part of my own approach uh cover cropping keeping living roots in the soil to hold the water themselves a lot of the the cultural practices right but worst comes to worst, we did set up an irrigation system, a drip irrigation system that we utilize. Right. Um, and we have well water that mm -hmm. we're running off of. The way I think about water is we should treat it like it's already gone. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Not because I'm, I'm pessimistic sometimes, but <laughs> not because I'm overly pessimistic, but just because um, I think conserving it before we even have to, you know, is a big part of the, the ethos that I'm trying to create here. And the well really does, uh, really does stay pretty, pretty solid. So tell us a little bit about your collaborations with uh, faith-based organizations. So um, we work with First Baptist Church, um, the church up on Monument Avenue. They own the land here. And the agreement that we have with them is actually really cool. Uh, we use this fourth of an acre and grow as much food as we can and donate it to their, their outlets, their pantries their food donation pantries. And in exchange for that, our three different entities get to use and farm the land for our own. For our That's own. That's a nice synergy. I think a special thing to be in a cashless exchange in times like sure. these, like sure. to, to create a resiliency in communities like this. They're helping us out a lot. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go check out the uh, mutual aid pot. I, I feel like we've just scraped the surface of like collaborating with like churches. It's the churches that got out of the land, man. Yeah. And they just be sitting with it and don't really be doing nothing with it. Yeah, churches, man, they own they own the land. I mean, some what, 20, 30%. So, mutual aid. Tell me how your work as a farmer is intersecting with this whole mutual aid resurgence that we're seeing in light of the recent uprising. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's been beautiful, man. It's been beautiful. They've really made moves as an organization to kind of create 
a farm partnership model mm. where they provide financial support um, to farmers who will grow specifically for their for their outlets, right? So it's kind of like a small, like a stipend slash small wholesale, but also partial donation. Paying you to grow stuff for them. Right, right. Nothing goes to waste, you know? So part of it will be donated each week, part of it paid for. Yeah, I feel like the, uh, I feel like mutual aid is just a new look, you know? Like what it looks like to support people that might not be able to afford what we're, what we're growing you know, full price. And That's whatnot. fascinating. We need new systems of, uh, that evolve us from like just the benevolent charity model. It's more like, okay, well, what's the exchange? It evolves the combo from, oh yeah, just grow the stuff and give it away. It's like, nah, that's not- That's not the move. That's not how it works. Uh-uh, that's not how it works because as soon as, we've seen so many examples, as soon as you leave, right. what did you leave behind? You know, like what kind of situation did you leave behind for right. people? Right. Yeah, man, totally, totally. Well, let's go get a, have, have a seat in the shade, man. Shit, yeah, let's uh, do that. <laughs> and, and chop it up a little bit about why it is you do this stuff. Yeah, yeah. all right, cool. let's go. Man, thank you so much for taking the time to walk with us through the space and show us around some of the things that you got going on. What is Real Roots Food Systems? It's something I created as a company, organization, entity, uh, based around increasing participation in the food system. Obviously, we have a main goal of growing food for the community, various selling it, donating in different ways, various outlets. But we got a couple of different aspects of things we're centering too. One being uh, BIPOC participation in the food system and knowing where their food comes from. And then experimenting with alternative forms of exchange within that. Finding different ways to value each other. We got currency, you know, but we also have land, we have space, we have each other's time, and I want to create an entity that can pull all that, pull all that in together. What, what inspired you to get involved in agriculture? What brought you to this space? First and foremost, ancestors, my ancestral calling. What I feel like was a call to the land that I heard at some point mm. and recently decided to listen. And sometimes I'll, I'll call it, uh, I'll weirdly call it a trauma response mm. to the conditions that I've found myself in as a black person in my society and realizing the lack of resources, the lack of access that my people have endured for the past too long. Mm. It was a calling. I didn't go to school particularly for agriculture. I went to Howard up in D.C. and studied actually etymology and mm -hmm. uh, philosophy, ancient, ancient Latin, ancient, ancient languages. So I feel like that kind of brought me in from a different angle yeah, um, sure. to, to the same endpoint, you know, which is understanding why, I guess, why it's important for a people to be connected to the land, mm -hmm. why it's important for us to, to know how to value each other and to know why it's important to eat good food that, that we grew. Like, why is this necessary for black people to be involved in? We're in a situation where we're not in control of our destiny. I feel this disconnection. I feel like we're disconnected from our ability to and have control over the health of our bodies, our economics, our, the land that we own. It feels like a battle. Mm. I'm here trying to do, you know, on my, on my little square of the earth, my little square of the planet, trying to perfect the system as far as land justice, land justice. is yeah, concerned, like, sure. talk a little bit about that from your, from your perspective. The hardest thing for me getting started was access to land. Mm. My family doesn't own any land. Mm. When you go into the zone of the USDA and trying to find like those loans for land purchase and things like that, mm -hmm. without a certain level of access to capital, mm -hmm. you don't get that land either. <laughs> you don't get the access to that land either, right? The creativity that I feel like we have to display to be able to even get a small patch to be able to do our thing out here is too, it's too much, mm. you know what I mean? Mm. It's too much mm. for someone who might just be casually interested or in, in growing food or casually interested in, in expanding a skill set that they have. It's tough, man. Like, yeah, hey, it's, 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 uh, <laughs> it's, it's real. One thing that I think about is whether or not it's my own responsibility to be able to fix the problems that have been created over 
mm. centuries, you know. We went from 50,000 black farmers down to maybe, maybe a stack, maybe a thousand here in Virginia. And like, we gotta stop the bleeding, right? right. Like, right. we gotta right. stop right. the bleeding. Right. And part of that is is access to land where we can stay and have some security mm. um, and not be year to year figuring out if we can even farm that next year, right? Like There are so many people that wanna hear more about food access and food deserts and things like that. What are some things that you wish we were talking about? I keep using this term alternative exchange, mm. right? Um, we have one of the things that we implement at Real Roots is a volunteer workforce, a collective workforce, mm. where people will put in a couple hours a week. I really wanted to create a mechanism for people to be able to pop in and passively participate in, in cultivating the land. Mm. My, my father's Jamaican mm. and one of the, you know, most beautiful spiritual systems from Jamaica is Rastafari, the Rastafari culture. The way that it's everybody's right and responsibility to participate in how food is grown around them is something that I'm, I'm trying to bring in. I'm trying to pull it in. I think in America in particular, we don't have the right or the responsibility for the land that's around us, for the, for the land that we are on, right? Like you go to the edge of the street and it's the sidewalk and you don't, you don't own it, but you also don't even have the responsibility to take care of it either. Mm, mm, and that mm. level of disconnect is, is scary, it's dangerous. When you have a land that you're on, you have both the right to eat from the trees, to eat from the, from the plants, and the responsibility to take care of it mm. and make sure that it's given to you. So we can think bananarchy mode where you've taken banana trees, saplings, and splitting them and planting them yourself, knowing that they'll grow one day and create fruit for you. Mm. But over here, it's got to look a little different. Right. And in America, in Virginia, Central Virginia, it's got to look a little different. You don't have to be a farmer. You don't have to have deep farming experience. Everybody should have a mechanism to be able to pop in, see what it's like to grow and know what they're eating. Mm. And then my the workforce is, is paid in food each week. Check. You know what I'm saying? So a focus of mine that the hours stay small, mm -hmm. that the barrier stays low, mm -hmm. but that everybody can get a high level of education, a high level of exposure to a real level of, uh, of production relative to the space we got, um, and hopefully be able to take those ideas and autonomously apply them to the situations that they, they find themselves in. What is your thoughts on like bringing back those ideas of indigenous communal, you know, quote unquote ownership into the space as a tool, right, for resiliency? One thing that I, in my limited knowledge, one thing that I understand about old world agricultural systems, indigenous systems, is that land was communal first mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and ubiquitous, right? And some of the concepts that we, in the regenerative ag, sustainable ag world, that we scoff at, things like monocropping, mm -hmm. right, were big parts of indigenous growing systems, mm -hmm. right? Why? Because you could monocrop, you could plant 100 acres of uh, corn or whatever, right, right, right. and because you were respecting the land and mm -hmm. centering the quality of the land for usage for everyone, mm -hmm. you could get away with that. Right, right, and right. You, could, you could fertilize well, you could manage the land well. Mm -hmm. They were monocropping? Right. And it's like, yeah, they were because you can do that the right way too. Right. Not everything from old world can be applied to new world. And it's like, that's true on the most basic of levels. But if you can modernize and adapt a lot of the concepts from, from our past, from the country's past, mm. uh, the past peoples and current people, it can still deeply apply and be, and be, a, and be a big part of you know, how, we grow, how we grow in food. Thank you so much for uh, chopping it up with us today, man. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, thank you for creating this outlet, man. For real. Yeah. Like, this, is, this is critical. Bro. Yeah, I appreciate it's critical. you. This has been Black Space Matters. I'm your host, Deron Chavis. We've been with Mark Davis today. Yeah, make sure y'all tune in to the next episode where we bring you some of my close friends and comrades who are stewarding the land uh, from a Black perspective in the Central Virginia region.